I come to this conversation from a legal perspective, so I'm a lawyer interested in understanding not only how does the law apply to human-robot interactions, but also what kinds of new laws might we need in the future. And in that context, I will be discussing uh, the possible introduction of robot imp impact assessments or human robot impact assessments um, in a similar way to other impact assessments that we have in other fields. And I will try to relate this more specifically to robot deception. So perhaps human robot impact assessments can help us to assess some of the problems with robot deceptions. But I would like to start with the general perspective on human-robot interaction. So here you can see my uh, interaction with Pepper, which was, um, uh, well, there were a, a number of misunderstandings in the salutations. There is no, no sound to this, but you can see that uh, the robot is trying to understand what, what I am doing, and the handshake that I that I tried to did not work, um, but the uh, the initial um, um, well at the end there there is a way of of, of getting together uh, and understanding each other. And if you look at my facial expressions, you you may you may note that th there is some emotion also going on 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 my side of of the picture. It was a bit like interaction with an animal or a child or something like that. But I was, in a sense, trusting the robot to not damage me. And so what is then the legal relevance of human-robot interaction? So far, we don't have many specific laws on human-robot interaction, but there is this proposal from the European Parliament that human-robot interaction should be based on two independent relationships, namely predictability and directability. So in a sense, I'm able to predict what the robot is doing. The robot is trying to predict what I am doing, and we have some kind of conversation in that sense. Um, and, and, and also, in a sense, I'm directing what is happening, or someone is at least directing this. So the question is, whether some of uh, some types of deception might be relevant in this context. So, um, for example, if I can't predict whether this is a robot or not, then I may not be able, well, then, then this principle here would perhaps be violated. So deception can be a problem in this context, but this is only an initial starting point, I think, for a larger conversation about human-robot interactions and the law, which we have to have in the future. Maybe these two principles uh, are relevant. I think they are, but, but there might also be other principles that also can be relevant. We also have fundamental rights legislation, which also can play in that context, but we still don't know exactly how to apply that to human-robot interactions. Now I would like to get back to the perspective of robot deception. And I think I would particularly focus this on um, Android robots or virtual humans, uh, as is in line with uh, previous speakers. Um, and I guess, in a sense, we've been in the, in the morning, we've been speaking about when it is ethically OK that there is robot deception. And I think also, from a legal perspective, there might be some cases in which it is permitted that the robot deceives you, and other cases in which the, le the law might somehow uh, prohibit uh, robot deception. So maybe I, I would invite the audience and, and fellow panel panelists to help me with, with ideas for when would it be uh, prohibited um, to use robot deception? Any, any ideas? So in other words, when is robot deception prohibited under the law as we have today? The robot takes 
the robot takes advantage of you and, and what law is then relevant? Fraud. Sorry? Fraud. Fraud, yes. Other ideas? Yes. Okay, so here, here are some ideas I have. For example, there might be certain criminal acts that could be relevant. Fraud was mentioned, identity theft, hacking, certain sexual offenses when the Could robot. Sorry, because we are really learning a lot from you, and that's why we are looking at the process of this part, because we need your help. So, so, so let's say, let's say. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't thought the sexual offenses part through. But fraud is is relatively easy. So in a sense, the um, the robot would be used by a criminal to uh, have you do something that you otherwise wouldn't do um, because you're misunderstanding something. Um, the sexual offense, I just think that um, there might be situations in which. Um, sexual offenses could be committed through deception and if that is the case under those criminal laws then perhaps um, robots deception might also play a role there but I haven't really thought this uh, ro robot deception fully through but another aspect would be consumer protection so the the the, um, the robot makes you uh, tricks you into buying a product um, which would which, which would be uh, then uh, a problem under consumer protection laws. Or let's say uh, uh, the context of war, you have a robot which impersonates a um, non-combatant and is but, but is really a war robot that is going to explode. So perhaps the prohibition in public international law for uh, the prohibition of perfidy in war might be relevant there. So there might be cases in which the law already prohibits deception because it also um, prohibits deceptions in other contexts. So it's, of course, not the robot that is violating any uh, rules itself, but it is the human that is using the robot for deceptive purposes which are already prohibited under the law. Um, any comment to, to that? There was okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At the latest stage. Okay. At the latest stage. Great. Then, then let me so. th let me get back to. Um, of course, there is also a spectrum. The green light would be. Uh, let's say you're using the robot in a theater. Uh, in a theater play, fantastic. You don't know which of the the players is the which of the actors is a human, which of is a robot. Could be a very nice theater evening fully unproblematic and, and many people would pe pay for actually going to a theater um, a, a, to, a, to a play like that. But then I'm interested in the difficult cases in between where the law is not really clear and where we may have some ethical problems such as those that were highlighted in the morning but we don't really know exactly what would be the, the the, the problems, what is, what is actually happening, how the law applies, and so on. And my, my initial question or hypo hypothesis, perhaps, is that perhaps we might use something like an impact assessment for those doubtful cases in the middle. So that is basically my research question. Maybe could it be possible to use impact assessments in that, for those doubtful cases where we don't really know what is, uh, what is prohibited, what is permitted, and so on. Um, so impact assessments are simply structured processes for considering the implications of proposed actions. And there are many different impact assessments in all kinds of contexts. So you have, for example, policy or regulatory impact assessments. For example, consider Brexit. Brexit without a good uh, impact assessment would have been a nightmare. We'd have, we would have been discussing Brexit for many years and it would have been total chaos. So, 
Of course, yeah. So there was no impact assessment for, for Brexit, and you see some of, the, some of the consequences there. Environmental impact assessments. You are polluting what is the impact on the environment. Data protection impact assessments under the GDPR, there are requirements already that you have to do an impact assessment uh, of certain uh, contexts, and I'll get back to examples for that. It was previously called data uh, privacy impact assessment. Now it's often called uh, data protection impact assessment. And then there is this proposal by some people, some of them are in the audience here, to create a robot impact assessment or a human robot impact assessment, which may perhaps um, uh, create some, some mechanisms for dealing both with the ethical and the legal issues uh, and the social issues in conjunction. So this is a paper written um, by Edward, who is here and who will be speaking after me, um, about the creation of a care robot impact assessment published in 2015. Um, that th this one focused on care robots uh, particularly. Um, this is a paper about human impact assessments of robots uh, implemented in Finnish elderly care. So again, we have human-robot interactions. So is there, is there a question? No. No, okay. Um, we have human-robot interactions, and the proposal in, in this paper here is to do a human impact assessment and assess the impact the robot has on the environment, in, in this context, on the elderly care. So, so far, there is no clear legal obligation to do this. This would be perhaps best practice, um, but it's not uh, legally mandatory. But one thing we could do, or that the lawmaker could do, in the future would be to create something as a mandatory robot impact assessment, um, just as we have it in the GDPR for the data protection impact assessment. So I, I'll, I'll briefly give you a perspective on the GDPR uh, on this point. So the GDPR um, Article 35 deals with data protection impact assessments. And the first um, paragraphs actually basically only describe the contexts in which um, a data protection impact assessment has to be done. And we can start by noting that um, the use of new technologies, which could be robots, might be a context in which uh, the uh, data protection impact assessment is actually required. And particularly if there are high risks to the, law, to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So this might also be some of the context in which we've di discussed earlier today. Are there risks for the humans in the context of interacting with, with robots? And the uh, GDPR uh, rule says that it is particularly um, uh, relevant um, and required in the context of special categories of data. So that includes medical data, the processing of medical data, such as elderly care and so on. And um, also the systematic monitoring of publicly accessible areas on a large scale. And so although the robot may, may also just uh, engage in uh, monitoring very locally, the robots can also be connected, and if you have hundreds of robots which are connected, then in a sense you are monitoring uh, a larger space. So some of this context actually is quite relevant for, for what we are speaking about, but then the overall focus is still very much on data protection, personal data, and the processing of personal data. So in a sense, it does not fully give us everything that we would need to deal with some of the, the doubtful cases of human robot impact assessment. So I'll just give you a brief overview of um, what is required under the GDPR. So first you have to do a systematic description of the processing of the operations and the purposes of the processing. So, in this, and that is actually quite important to understand what is actually happening here. 
how are you processing personal data, um, for what purposes? And just describing uh, f uh, somehow neutrally what is actually going on might be quite useful in many different cases in which you actually deploy robots. The next step is um, focused very much on the processing, the conditions for processing personal data, the necessity and proportionality of processing operations. So this is very much data focused, personal data focused. And then there is the assessment of the risks to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. This is an interesting one because it combines both the risk perspective, which might be relevant, but it also brings in the rights and freedoms of data subjects. So some of the conversations we had this morning about dignity might suddenly come in relevant here because rights and freedoms of data subjects could also be conceived in a, in a broader context or at least it would be possible to take this as a starting point for a broader conversation which also includes, includes dignity. And then you have to uh, um, address measures envisaged to address those risks, including safeguard security measures, and so on. So, in a sense, this might be a model that could be extended for the human-robot uh, interaction context, but um, it is interesting also to see to what degree this is a risk-based approach, and maybe the risk-based approach doesn't really fit that well with uh, the focus on um, values such as dignity, which, which might be uh, even more relevant in, uh, in this context. So my, my, when you look at how um, data protection impact assessments actually work, when you look at the methodologies that are being proposed for doing this, they are usually very much risk management based. So typically, um, the, the uh, uh, framework, the methodologies that have been proposed for data privacy impact assessments um, focus much on risk assessments. So you identify risk. For example, here, you could identify in the picture, you could in identify two risks. One, um, the person might fall, and the second, he might also get a, a sunburned. And then you would, you would do a risk analysis, and you would say, okay, that he falls is, is very likely and would have severe consequences. The sun burned, uh, not very likely, and the consequences aren't that, that big. So you would have two risks. One would be a high risk, not acceptable. One is a lower risk, acceptable. So risk management is often very much focused on these kinds of perspectives on quantifying risk, calculating risk, and that is useful in certain contexts but doesn't really fit very well with an approach focusing on human dignity, human rights, and some of these broader values that need to brought, be brought into the picture. But in a sense, um, so it, here in, in the risk management context, risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So risk management is very much focused on uncertainty and understanding uncertainty, managing uncertainty, calculating uncertainty, and the impact is perhaps a bit lost sometimes when, at least when it's very uh, an engineering focus on, on risk management. Um, on the other hand, if we could say that effect could also be an impact, and if there is no uncertainty, and if we don't really need to take into account uncertainty aspects, then perhaps um, just identifying impact and, um, and evaluating impact might also work well, and we could basically just disregard the whole uncertainty discussion when it is not that relevant. So we might, in, a, in, in, a, in an impact assessment, uh, consider both things. So when, when you look at the proposals that have been developed in the literature so far, for example, Edward's proposal um, is, is quite focused on risk, but on the other hand, he, he also says risks impact on subjects featuring legal, ethical, and technological aspects. So he has this broader perspective that goes beyond a pure um, mathematical, quantitative perspective on, on risk management. I think 
we would need some, some further discussions about how an impact, a human robot impact assessment could actually work and how it could go beyond um, this uh, risk management aspect, which may be relevant, but not, uh, not only. So to conclude, I would say that we already have some frameworks for mandatory impact assessments. We have the data protection Im impact assessment. But on the other hand, it doesn't really solve our problem because it is very much focused on data privacy and, and uh, excludes, in a sense, many of the questions that we also need to address in the context of human-robot interactions. We have proposals, several proposals indeed, for robot impact assessments, but those are voluntary um, and we, don't, we, we would still need to, um, to dis discuss further how we can bring in questions such as human dignity and self-determination into this context. And it is still a question of, of future work, how we deal with this question of is this risk we are really interested in or is it impact and how can we bring in these ethical uh, perspectives into something that is not just a calculation of risk. So this was uh, everything I had to say for now. Thank you.